So in this question, we'll talk about how to deal with a regression model that potentially has heteroscedasticity in the error terms. We are dealing with house price data, house price sales. So we have a data set with 88 observations, so it's relatively small. Our dependent variable are house prices. And as explanatory variable, we use the, the size of the plot, number of square feet of living area, and the number of bedrooms. And these are our explanatory variables. So let's go to R and uh, import the data, set the working directory, and import the data and plot some summaries. So let's do this. So here is our summary so you can see the average house price just shy of 300,000 uh, the medium number of bedrooms is three maximum seven and there's information about the the lot size and the number of square feet of the living area so now we want to run a regression model we do that here we get some estimated coefficients, so an intercept, lot size, square feet, and number of bedrooms. We can see that two of those, lot size and uh, square feet, so that's the living area, appear to be uh, statistically significant. Let's firstly check whether we got it right. So what we want is that the coefficient to the lot size is 0 0.002068. And is that the case? So lot size here we have what it says here is 2.068 and then e to the negative 3. That means we're moving the decimal point 3 positions to the left. 1, 2, 3. And that will then be 0 0.002068 as required. The question we shall tackle now is the question of whether there's potentially heteroscedasticity in our error terms. How would we investigate that? And we uh, briefly introduced two ways, a graphical approach and a hypothesis testing approach. So let's begin with the graphical approach. What we need to do is to display the residual terms relative to the explanatory variables. So that is done in here. So here we have a residual plot against all the three variables, lot size on the left, square feet in the middle, and number of bedrooms on the right. You can see, let's start with number of bedrooms. We of course only have discrete numbers. So that's why these observations line up neatly on these vertical lines. So, but if you see, if you look at this, on average, of course, the residuals will be zero, as they should be. And is there any tendency that the variance increases or decreases for higher or smaller number of bedrooms? It's not so obvious. It looks a bit like for only two bedrooms, all observations seem to be fairly close, but we also only have very, very few observations. So don't be deceived by that. So there's no clear indication here. And in some sense, you can say the same when we plot the residuals against the square feet, the size of the living area, no apparent pattern. And for this data set, also the same for the lot size. Okay, so we can see no clear pattern. This picture is a little bit difficult to see because we have this one observation here on the right. So a house which uh, is apparently on a big lot size. So that's some massive ranch or something. So that means these plots are rather inconclusive. And that will quite often happen, but that doesn't mean that there isn't necessarily some heteroscedasticity. It could be error variance, but in some in some sense, uh, error variance, which is a function of a combination of these variables. And just by looking at these individual sc scatter plots, we can't see that. So then, of course, we have learned about uh, a hypothesis test. So the question now asks you to describe the testing procedure. So let's do this and then finally we will 
implement the testing procedure in R, that will be much easier than describing the testing procedure. But let's see. So we have our regression model and the house price. So let HPI be the house price of the i house and then the other three variables we shall abbreviate as uh, x1, x2 and x3 i with their respective coefficients alpha1, alpha2 and alpha3 and we have an error term. So you can think of the lot size that could be x1 number of square feet could be x2 and the number of bedrooms could be x3. So the testing procedure will in a first step estimate this model by all s and we save the residuals. In a second step we run an auxiliary regression and that has as a dependent variable the squared values of the estimated residuals. As explanatory variables on the right hand side we have to decide what we want to use. We want to use anything that is potentially useful to explain variation in our proxy for the error variances here. So let's use all the explanatory variables which we have but only let's use them only in the levels in which we have them so no squares and we have a new error term so we were told call this the uh, Preuss pagan test but the name isn't so important so what we want from this auxiliary regression is the r squared and then in the final test we can calculate our test statistic. That test statistic we call an LM test. It is calculated as n times the R squared. That n is the number of observations in our auxiliary regression, so that's 88. So we can write this down, that's 88 times the R squared. And that R squared, importantly, is the R squared from the auxiliary regression in step two, not the R squared from the estimated model in step one. And then how do we perform our test, our null hypothesis, null hypothesis of no heteroscedasticity. is that all these three coefficients are equal to zero, indicating that none of these variables on the right hand side can explain variation in the dependent variable, which is our proxy for the error variance. So the alternative that any of these three coefficients, gamma i, is unequal to zero and that is for i equal to one two or three and in that case we would have heteroscedasticity so then we reject the null hypothesis if the calculated test statistic is larger than the critical value that test statistic how is it distributed? It's distributed as a chi-square distribution, in our case, with three degrees of freedom, because we estimate or we test for three restrictions. And that test is valid asymptotically for sufficiently large sample sizes. Now, whether 88 is sufficiently large, it's not so obvious, but it's the only thing we can work with. So, how do we do this in R. Now, before we do that in R, let's remind ourselves that the decision rule, if you were to use p-values, is the following. 
we reject if the p-value is smaller than alpha. So we haven't set a particular alpha here. That means in an exam you could set your own alpha. So let's say we use an alpha of 1%. So let's go to R. What we use is the BP test. Okay, and what we shall do, we calculate two BP tests. The first one is what's called the standard one, and that is the one which we just specified. And then it's BP test, and you just feed in reg1. That is where we saved our initial regression model, reg1. Okay, so let's go and run BP test reg1. What we get is a p-value of 0.002782. So that is smaller than an alpha of 1% and therefore we would reject the null hypothesis. Here you can see the test statistic that is n times r squared and the degrees of freedom, three degrees of freedom because what that test tested is exactly the test which we described. So the variables we now use on the right hand side of the auxiliary regression are the lot size, the squared lot size, the square feet, the squared square feet, bedrooms and the squared number of bedrooms. So let's run this. What we now get is six explanatory variables on the right hand side. So we have six degrees of freedom. Here's our test statistic. It is larger than the original test statistic because we include more explanatory variables and you know that the R squared will then always increase. Our p-value in fact is about the same right? because we also increase the degrees of freedom but it's still smaller than one percent so we should we will still stick to the same decision. We in particular we will reject the null hypothesis of no heteroscedasticity and therefore conclude that there is heteroscedasticity in the data. So now we've established that there is heteroscedasticity in the residuals, you as a very studious follower of econometrics will realize that if you wanted to perform inference on any of the coefficients in the original regression model, so these, this, this, or this, what we need is a different type of standard error for these estimated coefficients. In particular, if we are dealing with heteroscedasticity, we need white standard errors. So how do we do that in R? So that's pretty straightforward. We use this function coef test. Well, really, the output of that function coef test will already produce us t statistics and inference based, however, on a variance covariance matrix that is sort of a non standard one. And you just need to know, or you need to know where to find out, that if you want white standard errors, you just have to use this command coef test, reg1, that refers back to our regression model but then we're basically telling R to use different standard errors and these type of standard errors here are the white standard errors. So let's just run this. So what you get is a new, almost like a regression table. So these coefficients here are exactly the same. They're unchanged to the coefficients in your original regression model, reg1, but these standard errors here are different. Okay, so let me just um, show you the reg1 summary. So that's the original regression one summary. So we have an, uh, for instance, lot size of 2.068, 2.068. Okay, it's this and this are the same, so the coefficients are unchanged, 
but the standard errors are different. So here we have a standard error of 0 0.0013 approximately. That's the white standard error. And here we have a standard error of 0 0.00064. So this one is smaller, but of course we know it is incorrect. We should really be using the white standard error here. So here looking at our sort of regression output or at least the coefficient part using white standard errors we can see that now only the number of square feet so that's the size of the living area that is the only statistically significant variable whereas previously we also said that the lot size itself is statistically significant now however that has a p-value of 0 0.1022 so that is a p-value not smaller than any of our usual alpha values. The last part of this question, part four, asks why we would consider a weighted least squares estimation of the regression model in equation one. Recall the regression model, not in equation one, in part one of the question that was the model described above and represented here in step one of our testing procedure. So why would we do that? We found using the testing procedure, the white test or the uh, proj pagan test, whichever we used, we found that the error terms are heteroscedastic. So that means when we estimate these parameter coefficients alpha naught to alpha three by OLS, we will get parameters which are still unbiased, but not efficient anymore. And weighted least squares estimators, the estimation type mentioned in part four, is a specific form of a generalized least squares estimator. And we have learned that in principle we can use a generalized least squares estimator to obtain an efficient parameter estimator for a regression model in which we have heteroscedastic error terms. So that is why we would consider a weighted least squares estimator. What you need for a weighted least squares estimator is a variable that you can reasonably assume is in some sense proportional to the standard error of the error terms. Okay, so we need the, the variation of the error terms. We need a variable that captures the differences in variations of these error terms. We looked previously at a scatter plot of the estimated regression residuals against all three explanatory variables. But none of these variables was immediately apparent as the variable that would drive any changes in the residual variance. So in fact, we don't really know which variable we should use in terms of a weighted least squares estimation. So in, in that sense, weighted least squares doesn't offer itself as an immediate solution to the problem. Perhaps we could use something like feasible generalized least squares, but we didn't talk about this in detail.